Janet Demita Jo Jackson, singer, songwriter, actress, and dancer. Janet Jackson is the youngest of the Jackson musical dynasty, but she's so much more than that. People didn't really expect much of her when she was a kid, I don't think, because she was the little cute one. But as she grew up and became a woman and took control of her career in the 80s, she created some of the most groundbreaking and influential black pop music of that decade, of the 80s and the 90s. Noted for her electrifying stage presence, her magnetic aura, and her ever so charming voice, Janet Jackson became a catalyst for her growth on MTV. Janet Jackson's known for really innovative pop music, groundbreaking videos. She was a musical force in the 80s and 90s that really changed the idea of what black female pop music could be with a series of incredibly amazing dynamic videos that were Heartland MTV. She rose up to break gender and racial barriers, and to this day, has become a role model for the youth, embracing her identity and reaching up to the heights of stardom. For me, I think Janet is that benchmark of excellence in black female pop, an innovator, a groundbreaker, an icon. Janet Jackson was born on May the 16th, 1966, in Gary, Indiana. She is the youngest of 10 children in the Jackson family, a working-class African-American family who all shared a two-bedroom house on Jackson Street. The Jackson family were in Gary, Indiana, so they were quite a poor family. They lived all together with, like, six kids, living together in a tiny house. The family is a very musical one who all share the same deep-rooted passion for R&B, pop, and hip-hop music. Her mother, Catherine Esther Jackson, came to play clarinet and piano and had aspired to be a country and Western performer. Growing up, it is said that she always referred to her daughter as my baby and often attended all of her concerts. Her father, Joseph Walter Jackson, also known as Joe Jackson, was a former boxer and came to be a crane operator who had love for the guitar and a local rhythm and blues band, the Falcons. He briefly performed in this band with his younger brother and would often try to keep it alive to add to his family's income. Despite their efforts, the Falcons did not get a recording deal and broke up after some time. Janet grew up with two sisters, Rebe and Latoya, and six brothers, Jackie, Tito, Jermaine, Marlon, Randy, and Michael. She lived at home with her sisters while her brothers and father lived quite an extravagant life in Los Angeles. At a young age, Jackson's brothers began performing as the Jackson Five. In March 1969, when Janet was barely three, they signed a record deal with Motown and soon had their first number one hit. Being on stage with my brothers was a wonderful experience, like a revelation. And uh, it was almost as if it was deja vu, as if it happened yesterday. Her life transformed very quickly. By the time she was like three or four years old, her brothers were already superstars. So she had a very unusual childhood in that respect because she could like switch on TV in, in, on Saturday morning and watch her brothers' as cartoons or she could see them perform on TV. They had hit records back to back. So she, in a way, she had quite a privileged growing up. She was in a sort of superstar world, you know, friends of the family like Dinah Ross and 
the Motown stars. And Janet was the young, quiet, shy one who I think expectations weren't very high of her, really, because it was all the focus at that time was on her brothers and their huge success. She later moved in with them while her brothers were making a name for themselves. The pop band sold more than 100 million records worldwide, and in 1980, the brothers were honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame as the Jacksons. Well, the Jackson Five were the first black male boy band, teen band. I mean, they were idols. You can't really underestimate the success, the cultural success of the Jackson Five, especially in terms of their meaning in black America, because they were, well, the success was phenomenal for a start. They had like five back-to-back number one records. They were everywhere. They were on, uh, on TV, they were returned to cartoons, they were on cereal boxes. There was a particular energy and vivacity to those songs. You know, there, there was an energy to those Jackson 5 records you couldn't deny. And so they just popped out of the radio. Everyone fell in love with them, especially Michael, because Michael had this spirit. He Obviously, Michael fronted the band and had this energy and this charisma and this voice, and even from a very, very young age. Some people thought he might be a midget, you know, like an old man, because his, his James Brown moves were so unusual for a kid so young. And I think it just grabbed the nation's attention, really. Janet's relationship with her father has been described as being complex. He is believed to have had a strict approach to raising his children and would often work way too hard to keep the family afloat. He is also said to have been emotionally withdrawn and told Janet to address him solely by his first name as a child. Their father was all about perfection and instilling in all of his children the essence and power of music. It is said that he didn't want his kids on the street or for them to get involved in drugs. He wanted better for his children. But this tough love would soon result to Jackson seeking her own independence. Both Michael and Latoya in their biographies talked about how jo- how strict Joseph was, you know, whether it was like physical abuse or what was more emotional abuse. They were scared of him. And I think that was the same for Janet. She possibly didn't suffer as much as the older kids, but she still was under the strict control of her dad and had to follow the family line and do what she was told, basically. Although a very musical family, growing up, Janet initially wanted to be a horse racing jockey or an entertainment lawyer with plans to support herself through acting. Her anticipation to join the entertainment industry in the footsteps of her family came to plan when she recorded herself in the studio. However, it is believed that once their father had recognized Janet's ability to sing, he had very much taken control of that pathway. Like all the Jackson kids, Janet really was controlled by her father from a young age and forced into really becoming, you know, an actress and then a musical star. She spoke herself many years later that that wasn't really necessarily what she wanted to do. It just was kind of felt inevitable. It was just like where the kids were expected to do is what she'd seen all her life since being a young girl. Like, that's what her brothers did. That's what her sisters did. For years afterwards, Janet said she had struggled to develop her own sense of identity as an artist under her father's watch. He had been so in charge of my life, my career, and was my manager, in many ways it was hard for me to say no. At the age of seven, Jackson and her brother Randy performed at the MGM Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. After making her debut at MGM Casino, she began acting in the variety show The Jacksons in 1976. This is what inevitably kick-started her career. The Jacksons variety show came about in the mid-70s, kind of at a time when there was a bit of a lull in the brothers' success. The hit records had dried up a bit, so their father, Joe, who was the manager, had this idea of creating a, uh, pitching them to do a 
all-American variety TV show with special guests. Kind of that sort of thing that the Osmonds were doing at the time. And that was the point really where Janet was first introduced into the spotlight. They'd done like gigs in Vegas and stuff where she first came out, would do like a Mae West impersonation or something like that. But then the whole nation got to know her because of the Jacksons TV specials. It didn't run very long, I think it was like about 12 episodes or something, but Janet was a key part of it. And what she really would do is come on and be cute, do little skits. Her and her younger, her brother, Randy, the youngest brother, would do like Sonny and Cher impersonations. And really people thought of her as like the cute younger sister. You know, this like chubby faced little girl. You didn't really get a sense from her in the Jacksons variety show of, of what she would become. Sunny and Cher. And the beat goes on. The beat goes on. And the beat goes on. And the beat goes on. Just keep on that rhythm to the break. Hey! La di da di di. La di da di di. La di da di da. Take it away, Jack. Just ha! Was once the race for the dawn. She then went on to appear as a regular on the 1970s television series Good Times and later as a teenager in the dance-oriented series Fame. There were big shows. I mean, the first one she got uh, cast in was Good Times, which was like a massive, long-running black American sitcom where she played a character called Penny. She was like an abused kid who was taken in by the family in the sitcom. Black America fell in love with Janet Jackson at that point because she played this series of roles starting in Good Times and going through different strokes where she was very much the girl next door, a young, very attractive, cute, relatable kid who had a certain naivety and charm about her. She had the ability to you know, perform these roles and, you know, for people to fall in love with her. At 16 years of age, Janet began her solo recording career at A&M Records and made her first album. Her first album, Janet Jackson, was released in 1982. Janet was very much assisted by her father during production and worked with a number of songwriters and producers. It came to be a huge success, peaking to number 63 just a mere four months later. In New Zealand, the album peaked at number 44 and in the United States, managed to sell over 82,000 copies through BMG Music Club. She followed this up with her second album, Dream Street, in 1984. It managed to sell 21,000 copies between 1991 and November 2006. This album also consisted of her very first music video, which was shot during the shooting of the TV show Fame. They were good. They were good. They were fine, kind of like fizzy teen pop records. A lot of fun. They weren't necessarily big hits. Although, I mean, she had a couple of minor R&B hits off the, off the records, but she didn't break through. She wasn't like, um, she didn't immediately become a massive star. It was at this point that Jackson began to take a different approach to her life. She took control of her career, moved out on her own, and developed her own sound and influential style. She reemerged in 1986 with her breakthrough record, 
control. Control was Janet's breakthrough moment. Janet had done a couple of albums that hadn't been received incredibly well, and the record company wanted to move things on. And her A&R guy at the time, John McLean, suggested she work with up-and-coming um, producers Jam and Lewis. And together they forged this incredibly um, groundbreaking sound which sort of fused hip-hop beats, harder industrial sounds with Minneapolis funk. And it was immediately a sensation because you hadn't really heard anything like that, especially from a young teen star of that age. And you can't, you can't really talk about Janet's success without talking about Jam and Lewis. Originally, Jam and Lewis were in The Time, so in the funk band The Time, and they started producing their own records and started having um, hits with acts like uh, the SOS Band and Alexandra O'Neill. And they wanted to work with a new act, and Janet Jackson made sense because she was a sort of... Uh, had all this potential, but hadn't quite yet been tapped into. What happened with Janet's Control album was that for the first time, she was actually part of the creative process. She hung out with Jam and Lewis and told them stories about her childhood, about where her life was at the time, and they incorporated that into the tracks. So all the songs on Control have this sort of semi-autobiographical feel, and she really invested herself in them, and she probably invested herself in that record for the first time more than ever. And I think that kind of energy and that honesty was what really connected with audiences. You know, to see a young te black teen female speaking honestly about her life and the pressure she was under and taking control was something new and fresh. The success of Control was so groundbreaking, she had like six top 20 hits off that album. So it was massive. Her striking, innovative, and fierce independence struck a chord with the youth of the day, and Jackson rose to a level of stardom that rivaled that of her brother, Michael Jackson. As time flew, Janet's collaborations with the production team of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis produced bold, beat-heavy, catchy songs that defined the punch and power of 1980s dance and pop music. But in 1984, this would briefly come to an end. Jackson married James DeBarge, but this marriage was far from perfect. It is said that Jackson married DeBarge in order to earn independence from her father. Additionally, they kept their relationship a secret. They began dating in the early 80s when Jackson was 16 and DeBarge in his late teens. Sparks flew far and wide over their mutual interest in music, who DeBarge had made many music hits like Rhythm of the Night and All This Love. It is said that they were so in love with each other that they almost started to block everyone else out. It was annulled a year later in 1985 due to her husband's profound addiction to painkillers and sleeping pills, a marriage that came to end all too soon. Like all the Jackson um, kids, really, they wanted to escape the strict control of their father. And I think Janet was no different. So in a way, although she was very privileged in her childhood, she also suffered because of the sort of strictness of the environment and the way in which Joe was such a domineering character, her father. And when she first met James DeBarge, I think she was 16 years old, and they met on the set of Soul Train, which is so appropriate. I mean, DeBarge were another musical family, so they had a lot in common. And they started a secret romance, and then they eloped a couple of years later. They ran off to um, Michigan and got married in a secret ceremony. And it was kind of Janet's first moment of rebellion to break away from that strict control of her father and try to become her own person. But what it didn't really work out. I mean, I mean there's a story on, her, on their wedding night where he just, just disappeared for hours. 
and no one knew where he was. And he was obviously out scoring drugs. And that became a bigger issue as the uh, marriage went along. And so really, it was a, a moment of teenage rebellion on Janet's part. They were both incredibly young. She was 16, I think he maybe he was 18. And um, it didn't really last very long, but I think it was an important stage in Janet's development, really, to prove to herself that she could do something to be her own person, even if it ended badly. She would return in 1989 with her most diverse work, Rhythm Nation. The album delivered seven pop top 10 hit singles, including Miss You Much, Escapade, and Love Will Never Do Without You. This album portrays rapid choreography with Jackson and her dancers. Some songs were also filmed in black and white to portray racial harmony, something that Janet later became known for. Janet had already broken records with like having six hits off the first album, of Control, but with Rhythm Nation, there was even more than like seven. She had seven top five hits in America, which is unbelievable, really, which was record-breaking at the time. And also, they was genre-wise, she'd, she'd rock with uh, Black Cat. She had like her big statement record with Rhythm Nation itself. She had like Miss You Much, which was the first single, which was like a gateway, but which kind of like eased people in, I think, to the themes of the album a bit. You know, with the videos, she had this sort of um, military look, very buttoned up with the sort of military jacket and the black cap. But by the end, she did a, a video with um, her Brits, Love Will Never Do Without You, where for the first time, she was like showing off her body and her navel was on display. It was a beautiful black and white video shot by um, her Brits on the beach. And that was the first time that Janet became sexy, really. She wasn't really thought of as like um, a sex symbol before that. She was um, cute, fun, Michael's little sister growing up. But by the end of the Rhythm Nation with, uh, cycle with Love Will Never Do, she was now a bona fide sex symbol. Janet and Jam and Lewis did that was really clever, I think, on the second album is that everybody was expecting Control Part 2 and they didn't want to make Control Part 2. They wanted to do something completely different. So they shifted the focus from Janet's personal growth as a young woman, taking control of her life, to a much more outward looking sort of state of the world kind of perspective where she was taking on big themes like um, social injustice and poverty and crime and. It was kind of Janet's What's Going On, really. The tracks, not all the tracks, but the key tracks, things like Rhythm Nation itself and State of the World and um, Living in a World We Didn't Make, she's kind of addressing these big themes in a relatable kind of pop, aesthetic way. By the end of the 80s, Janet was, without doubt, a megastar. And so her record contract with A&M was about to expire. And so she signed to Virgin Records for an unprecedented amount of the time. I think it was the biggest record deal of all time at that point for $80 million to do her next record, which was ended up being titled Janet with a lower case J. And yet again, her and Jam and Lewis wanted to move things on. So they had done the self-empowerment of control. They had done the social injustices of Rhythm Nation, and now they were doing something which really focused on Janet as a sexual young woman. That's what the Janet focus of Janet was really about. It was about her 
sexual awakening as a young woman. And so songs like If and That's The Way Love Goes really sort of embody that, I think. Particularly If, there's a whole erotic dance sequence and um, there's a simulation of oral sex at one point. That was really um, jaw-dropping at the time. People didn't expect Jack to go there, but she did. She continued to enjoy worldwide popularity and critical acclaim in the 1990s with the album Janet in 1993, Design of a Decade in 1995, and Velvet Rope in 1997. I think by the time of the Velvet Rope, she was really, I mean, she was a superstar, but there's a lot of baggage that she had had from the past that she hadn't really ever addressed starting from a yet very young age. I mean, even back when she was doing the TV shows like Good Times, she was told by the producers that she was too fat, she would lose weight. She had to bind her chest um, because she was, you know, did, uh, for the TV show. And there was all kinds of pressure she was under. And I think that also the, 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 her father being the way he was and her not really having a, a normal childhood, all that stuff had, you know, she'd been dealing with and pushing down and suppressing over the years. And when it came to the writing of the Velvet Rope, she finally had decided that she wanted to address it in her music. She'd come off the tour as well. The previous tour for Janet was a really gruelling, long tour. And she that was when she first started suffering depression during that. And the past, there was a thing in the past was catching up with her. So the theme of the Velvet Rope really was about the everyone needing to belong. So the idea of the velvet rope is that sort of rope that separates the celebrities from the general public. And her idea was, we're going to go behind the velvet rope. I'm going to take down that barrier and let you inside because we're all the same. We all need to belong. We all have these feelings ourselves. So that was really what she was getting at with, with that. But the, the album explored a lot more than that. It also talked about homophobia. It talked about domestic abuse. It also progressed her sort of sexual stuff. There was like S&M type tracks on there, like Rope Burn. It was her most adult album and probably her most groundbreaking in a way, although it, didn't, it wasn't as big as the, the three before, it was still a huge album. It, in terms of the, the kinds of the musical range on it, it was um, ambitious for sure. Well, Janet had already built up a big gay audience by the time that the Velvet Rope came out, but she'd never really addressed them overtly in her music. And on the album, the Velvet Rope, there, were, there was like several tracks which were a clear sort of uh, message to her, or, her gay audience. And amongst them, Together and Going, of course, which is a big hit, which she describes as a post-AIDS pop song. Then there was Tonight's the Night, which was a cover of the old Rod Stewart song, Ballad. But she sung and she didn't change the gender, so it was seen as like kind of a lesbian love song. And probably most overtly would have been the song Freeza, addressing gay love and homophobia and her stance on it, which was very kind of open and, you know, um, accepting, of course, because that's who Janet was, you know, she was surrounded by, you know, gay dancers and people growing up and she, you know, she was, wanted to talk about it. These records themselves, as well as their promotional music videos and live performances in concert tours, branded Janet as one of the world's most erotic performers 
garnering both criticism and praise. By the end of the 1990s, it was officially stated by Billboard magazine that she became the second most successful recording artist of the decade in the United States after Mariah Carey. She soon became the first artist to be named an MTV icon in an event held in Los Angeles, California. MTV was very white rock and roll only, but it took the Michael Jackson videos and then people like Prince and um, Donna Summer to start opening things up. But there hadn't really been a young black teen female star before Janet that ever got MTV play. And because she was making these videos of such high quality and that was so well produced um, with choreography and effects and um, you know, this great uh, sort of innovative new sound, it was irresistible for MTV playlists. You know, you had to program Janet videos because each one was a, an event and each one got better than the next. And you can't talk about Janet Jackson's videos really without talking about Paula Abdul either because Paula Abdul was the choreographer of the early um, videos and she really helped Janet find her feet in terms of how to perform in front of the camera. And she really sort of taught Janet the, the kind of some fundamental moves or mixing kind of street dance and hip hop um, to create sort of a new exciting um, form of dance really, which hadn't been seen before on MTV. In 1987, she began dating artist Rene Elizondo Jr. They married in 1991, but their marriage was kept a secret until it was announced that they had officially split up in 1999. Jackson would then go on to release All For You in 2001 and Demita Joe in 2004. But it was here that Jackson was at the center of a debate on decency standards on television when a wardrobe malfunction caused a scandal during her live performance at halftime of the 2004 Super Bowl. Well, in 2004, Janet was invited to appear at the Super Bowl, which was a huge deal because it has like a mega, like, 100 million plus audience in America. It's the biggest kind of TV event of the year, live TV event of the year. And so she was doing a, um, a medley of songs which ended with her old friend Justin Timberlake joining her on stage. Janet knew Justin from back in the day where NSYNC opened for one of her tours. So they were friends. And there's a song in, um, in, the, in the line, the song Rock Your Body, um, I'm gonna have you naked at the end of this song. And at that point in the choreography, Justin reaches across Janet's chest, rips open her bustier, which was supposed to reveal apparently a bra or something, but it didn't. What happened instead was that the whole thing came off and her breast was exposed. Where well, it wasn't really, that she was wearing a kind of um, a nipple shield, like a jewellery thing on her nipple. And it was no big deal. It, it literally you saw it for like a fraction of a second but it became such a media sensation in America and it was used as sort of political capital for a lot of people to kind of, the right wing to bang on about how standards of decency were going down in the public and this was a terrible, awful thing. And Janet was this sort of evil influence on the children of the, of, of the nation, you know. Especially as being a black woman, I think that made her, she was painted as this kind of Jezebel and she was really ridiculed and all eyes were on Janet, and she was to blame for this outrageous spectacle that had occurred that absolutely no one was really affected by, but everyone was bleating on about how it was so awful. Janet was, was uh, she'll apologise. I think the mistake Janet made was that she didn't apologise maybe straight away. She sort of sat on it for a while and waited. Justin eventually gave an apology, and her career suffered, you know. Effectively, her records were blacklisted. She wasn't played in the radio. She never really had another major hit of the same size, really, as she'd had before. And her album at the time, Demeter Joe, which is a very good record, it kind of bombed because she wasn't getting the airplay support that she would normally get. So it was hugely damaging for her. But this would only be one of many hardships Janet would come to face. Throughout her life, she had always been compared to her brother Michael, the king of pop. These comparisons often resulted on the relationship slightly being clouded. 
Michael Jackson is the best self-music artist of all time, with estimated sales over 400 million records worldwide. He is known as one of the most significant cultural figures of the 20th century. It is suggested in some Jackson family biographies that Michael was intimidated by his baby sister because she was stepping on his heels in the fame department. Sibling rivalry exists in plenty of families, but imagine what it must be like when a brother and sister are also two of the biggest music icons that the world has ever seen. Though reports suggest that the two siblings were very much joined to the hip, others also suggest that there was rift between the two. One of the reasons why her music was overshadowed, actually, I think at the beginning, particularly, was because her first album came out literally within a month or two of, of Thriller. So, you know, Michael was so such a big star in the early 80s. Janet existed in his shadow. By the time uh, Control had come out, you really weren't expecting that much of Janet. And she was very much referred to as Michael's little sister. But by the time that, that the Control cycle finished, she was very much a star in her own right. She was no longer his little sister. She was like a, her own super, a superstar in her own right, really. Janet and Michael were very close when they were kids. And so, of course, Michael wanted to help her as much as he could. So on the, uh, the very early records, before Control, Michael kind of appeared on, some, on the um, backing vocals on one track, and the other brothers did as well, and they were very supportive. And he was still supportive and thrilled, I think, when Control became a big hit. But as Janet's star got bigger and bigger, I think Michael's relationship with that sort of shifted slightly. You know, first of all, it was like, great, my little sister's done really well, Control's a hit. Then it was like, OK, Rhythm Nation's done incredibly well, and it's had more hit singles than I had on my last album. OK, this is good. And then it was like she was more of a rival, if anything. And there was a sense, if you listen to Michael's music, that he was actually trying to maybe play catch up a bit with Janet. He approached Jam and Lewis to produce him, which they initially turned him down, because her sound became more cutting edge, really. By the end of the decade, Jack Jackson's music was more in fashion than Michael's, really. What Janet had that Michael never had was that she was really street, I think, and relatable. Michael was incredible, of course. He was like a alien, superstar, force of nature, pop genius. But Janet had a relatability alongside her sort of superstar power and she was still street somehow in a way that Michael's never really wasn't street by that point regardless the siblings did make a song together scream By the mid-90s, Michael's career was not what it had been. There, there had been like, the first series of allegations which had been dealt with and he had um, kind of come to an agreement that had moved on and he had had his short marriage to Lisa Marie Presley and he needed a hit. The idea came to do a duet together. And it was odd really, because at that point, Janet was arguably a bigger star than Michael. Certainly she had a lot more cachet and a lot more street cred than he did. So in a way, she was almost doing him a favour to do a duet with him. And so they did the duet Scream together, which became a massive hit. Michael was very competitive with Janet. They did their vocals together and afterwards Michael insisted that he go back into the studio and re-record his vocals. He had that sort of competitive thing in him that he had to be the best. In the end, it worked really well together, actually. The two, the, their two voices combined and their dancing together is spectacular to see. When you see them dancing, in, you know, uh, the Scream video, which at the time I think was the most expensive video I've made, they're in a spaceship and they're uh, doing this kind of amazing synchronised choreography together and dropping down their knees and jumping up and spinning around. It's, it's amazing.
when Michael died, I think Janet was, because she was the biggest star in the family now, remaining star, she was kind of pushed forward, I think, a lot to take on the, um, the mantle of being spokesperson for the family. And at the BET Awards, um, a few months after he died, she said something to the effect of, um, to you, Michael Jackson's an icon, to us, Michael's family. And I think that kind of summed it up, really. She was having to deal, deal with her own personal grief while being in the glare of, like, the international media to expect to come up with something and talk about Michael. She was obviously personally devastated. In 2010, Janet met Qatari businessman Wassam Elmana and began dating him just shortly afterwards. The couple became engaged and married privately in 2012. They introduced a son together, Isa Elmana, when Jackson was at the age of 50. However, in 2017, it was announced that they had separated and were also looking to divorce. Her last album with Virgin Records would come to be 20YO that was first released in Japan in September 2006 and is a commemoration to the album Control on its 20th anniversary. 20YO represents the joyful and exotic history-making musical style of Control. An R&B and dance album, Janet collaborated with many producers earning at some point mixed reviews from critics, with some of them questioning the involvement of a few producers. The album made it to number two on the Billboard 200 and sold over 1.5 million copies. I think Janet Jackson was a million-selling megastar before she even did her first show. So her first big shows came on around the Rhythm Nation tour. And there was a huge expectation on her because, you know, people had seen the video because they were expecting that level of choreography and drama and effects, the production. And she didn't let them down. You know, that the shows were, she had like loads of dancers, she had like pyrotechnics and great staging. So from the get-go, she was really firing on all cylinders, I think, on the live front. When she became more of a sort of sex Janet, started appearing, she would invite men on stage and she would sort of do a lap, a sexy lap dance during the song Rope Burn. And she would also do a very Jackson type thing to do as well, was that when she would sing a ballad, like again, she would like break down and cry which is like a very Michael thing to do. And I, th I think that, you know, people wanted that from Janet. There's that sort of Jackson star power that she had. And so that in itself was, was, was you know, amazing to see on stage. But combined with all the kind of production, and the dancers and the effects, it made it kind of like a must-see show. So for, you know, decades, she was playing sold out arenas all around the world. Eventually, Janet parted ways with Virgin Records and released her 10th studio album, Discipline, in 2008. And in 2015, partnered with BMG Rights Management to launch her own record label, Rhythm Nation, and released her 11th studio album, Unbreakable, in the same year. Since then, she has continued to release music as an independent artist. Well, I think it really was a music for Control that gave that statement for her. I mean, that the song, the title track, Control itself, which was another big hit from the record, was like, it's autobiographical, totally autobiographical. So there's the lyrics in it, when I was 17, I did what my father told me. You know, it was playing upon the history that she had herself and putting it in front of people and, and helping people relate to her, I suppose. Young black teenage girls didn't really have anyone at that time to like really relate to and Janet had that history from the sitcoms I think and for the TV shows you've done of being sort of partly the girl next door but partly a superstar Jackson so it was this weird mix of relatability and superstar megawatt power that she had
Despite hers and her father's complicated relationship, Janet said that she and her siblings owe their father for holding them into the all-time great singers and performers they would very quickly become. Joe Jackson had died from pancreatic cancer in 2018 at the age of 89. Over time, Janet has sold over 100 million records, making her one of the world's best-selling music artists. She holds the record for the most consecutive top 10 entries on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 Singles Chart, along with Billboard placing her number seven on its list of Hot 100 all-time artists. Her time as an artist has been one far from easy, with her father watching over her as a child, to one day seeking independence and becoming a solo player, to also being in the shadow of her famous brother. Janet Jackson has been through it all and has very quickly become one of the world's most intuitive artists. I think Janet would be, seen, would be seen as an innovator in black pop music, you know, a groundbreaking star, especially the 80s and the 90s. Those records really redefined the, pop, the parameters of what black pop music could be. The fact that she was using pop music, which could be seen as like quite a frivolous, you know, art form, to talk about real issues, you know, especially with Rhythm Nation, with talking about sort of um, social injustice and poverty, and she's at the sort of vanguard of, of, of black contemporary pop music, for sure. And, you know, an icon for, for black women, for championing gay rights, just a, a superstar, really, a, a pop music superstar. Her ability to proclaim herself in charge of her life as she did in control, and fight society's problems as she did in Rhythm Nation, gave her the opportunity to influence inspire, and captivate much of her youth today. Janet Jackson, Making History.